to start with a few names. The Mitchell Slough, the Ruby River, big game permitting via FWP. These all, all deal with public access on private land. One's fishing access, the Mitchell Slough, stream access. Another is hunting access, but really the issue with private land. Hunting and fishing access affects not only Montana landowners, it also affects the anglers and the hunters in Montana, and that pretty much covers everybody. It's an important issue. So in the short time I have, I'm going to hit some of the highlights related to hunting and fishing access on private land, but I can't hit them all. So save some questions. If I say something that, that re resonates with you or you want to uh, discuss it further, bring it up in the Q&A or come find me afterwards. I'll be around all day. First, let's do a recap of where we are as far as access goes. Recently, we've seen several moves towards unlimited public hunting and fishing access on private lands in Montana. Again, the Mitchell Slough. What do we see there? The stream access law apply, applied to a ditch access law. In 1985, the Montana legislature passed the stream access law, and what it did was opened up all the streams in Montana that are natural and that are capable of recreational use. It opened them up to public recreation, recreational use. The natural, however, was an important limitation on stream access. And the Montana Supreme Court, in the Mitchell Ditch case, read natural right out of the law. What that means is irrigation ditches, river bottom systems that are questionably, that might incorporate natural features, are now open to unlimited public access. On the hunting side, year in, year out, we see ballot initiatives seeking to prohibit fee hunting, leasing of, public land, pri uh, leasing of private lands for hunting. The idea being is that private landowners ought not profit from a publicly held resource such as wildlife. Related, we see fish, wildlife, and parks pursuing a, uh, an agenda, block management, that will funnel access to private uh, hunting, private land rather, um, hunting on private land into one program, block management. What they're trying to do is limit the ability of landowners to contract individually and independently of fish, wildlife, and parks with the hunters and the outfitters. Related to that, big game permit allocation is unpredictable, meaning landowners will likely view wildlife as liabilities rather than assets. If they don't, if landowners don't know how many a, how many permits will be allowed in their in their area, they can't exactly plan ahead and manage the resources such as elk populations and deer, grouse, turkey, for 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 profit. What is the source of all this conflict? And I've just hit a few. I'm sure there's a lot more, such as road access. But what is the source of all this conflict? Well, I, I think there's at least three. First, there's changing demographics in Montana. Okay, we know that the population is relatively flat. In Montana, but we've also known that there's population decline in rural areas and rapid population growth in urban areas. What does this mean? All, a lot of the hunters are in uh, urban centers such as Missoula, Bozeman, and Billings. They're not neighbors to the big uh, private landowners out in, in, in the sticks, so to speak. And what that means is we've seen a result in the shift the way people go about trying to get access to private lands. In the past, according to my boss who, who's been hunting since before there were bullets, Landowners and hunters were neighbors. They knew each other, okay? There might be a generational uh, long amount of access to, to, to private land because it was your next door neighbor who granted it. And that gave the notion that there was unlimited access, that access was, was, was wide open. That was not the case, however. It was based on trust rather than government programs. Nowadays, city folks, such as myself, knock on doors out in rural areas to complete strangers and expect permission to, to private lands with little, little more than a police and sometimes less than a police. In other words, hunter, hunters and anglers don't often take the time to get to know private landowners before asking permission. The response uh, when, when they hear the word no is to seek permission through regulatory programs, through government agencies. Access is being taken away rather than granted via contracting via trust. On a related note, we've seen an influx of, of non-resident landowners in the state who may not appreciate the heritage of hunting and fishing access on private lands. And that's within their right to, to, to close up the gates if they so choose. But what this does is it upsets lots of folks who have, have held uh, generational type access to the same kind of private land. And third, and perhaps the most important reason, talking with some of my ranching friends, things are tight on ranches now. The cost of inputs for traditional ranching uh, products is, is, is going up, and the price of outputs is going down. Okay? Ranchers are you know, kicking over every rock they can to try to find alternative revenue streams. And many have pursued hunting and fishing le hunting leases and or rod fees as a way to make ends meet. And so you see even the, the, the multi-generational ranchers tightening up their belts and not letting access to everybody who comes knocking. Where is this all headed? 
I think it's only going to get worse as far as uh, the, the public access being forced on private landowners. The public trust doctrine is, is the principle that allowed uh, stream access, unlimited stream access. And the, pr and the, and the, the reasoning behind that was that the, the state owns the water. Okay, so if it's a public resource flowing across private land, landowners don't have a right to exclude the state uh, citizens from accessing that publicly owned resource. If you think about wildlife, that's a publicly held resource, just like water is. And it also flows across private land, much like water does sometimes. Herds migrate across. What's to stop the public trust doctrine, as it's worked out in stream access, to apply to, to hunting? I don't see very much. When we do have laws that protect private property rights, such as the natural clause in stream access, courts have to enforce those. In the Mitchell Ditch case, the Supreme Court showed that it's not willing to enforce a lot of those restrictions. The erosion of private property rights in the name of public access is incremental. It's taken pot shot by pot shot across the state. What are the consequences of this, well, of, of unlimited public access? Well, history has shown that open access discourages environmental stewardship. Basically, when you can't control access to your property, you'll view a resource such as an elk population or a, a stream that holds trout as a liability rather than an asset. Okay, so what does that mean for stewardship across the state? This is where hunters who may not own land need to consider the consequences. What are the incentives that are created by unlimited public access? They're not very good. Rangers are going to stop looking at those, her those elk populations as, as assets, and they're going to stop managing their land to improve the hunting opportunities for, the state, for, for, for all the citizens. Another consequence of public access expansion will be the continued animosity, or maybe worse than animosity, between landowners and hunters. This didn't used to be the case, but it is now. And still another consequence, to the extent that stream access continues to reach irrigation ditches, is that ranchers will lose control over their water and their irrigation structures. Think about that. That's your livelihood for those of you who ranch. So what is, with, with all this grim uh, portrait painted, what, it, what can we do? Well, lots. We can't really change the demographics of the state. I think the population growth in, in the urban areas is going to increase. Um, we can't really force non-residents to open up their, their, their properties, even if they've been open uh, for years past. But what we can do is seek legislation, elect public officials who respect private property rights. That might sound grandiose and lofty, so I'll give you even a more, a more basic approach to doing this. If anybody knocks on your property and asks for access, have them sign a declaration that says that they support private property rights. If they realize that you're get granting this access for hunting or fishing, um, perhaps because they trust you or because they realize that you respect private property rights. Regulations that allow uh, property owners to contract with hunters and, and anglers. Allow, uh, we, need, we need policies that allow uh, ranchers to, to contract with hunters and fishers, and with anglers. And if they do, they'll, they'll, they'll view these resources as assets rather than liabilities. And that, I think, is the, is the ultimate response. Thanks very much.